Britain's favourite antiques experts. Let's get fancy. Behind the wheel of a classic car. I'm always in turbo. And a goal to scar Britain for antiques. Hot stuff. The aim to make the biggest profit at auction. <gasps> but it's no mean feat. There'll be worthy winners. Cha ching. Oh my goodness. And valiant losers. <laughs> Bonkers. Will it be the high road to glory? You are my ray of sunshine. Oh, stop it. Or the slow road to disaster. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> This is Antiques Road Trip. Yeah. Welcome to South Lanarkshire. This is the best. It's absolutely gorgeous. Isn't it just wow? What, we're actually not far from my parents. Should so we just pop in and see them? Let's go and see Philip and Honestly, Barbara. they've got lovely stuff in their house. Well, we can I have think some of it. They would give us a oh, really good yeah. deal. That's your inheritance, Tash. It's the third leg with auctioneers about town, <laughs> Philip Serrell and Natasha Raskinshaw. This is the crucial third leg. Something always happens on the third leg. Someone always makes a play. So who's your money on? You. No, don't be so daft. Our best chums are zooming around in the 1972 MGB Roadster. Look at this gal. Yeah, that is definitely... You know how you can tell? <laughs> they got the rubber gloves hanging down at the back end. <laughs> so eloquently put, Phil. So far, this pair are putting the jazz into pizzazz. Chef's kiss. Gorgeous. Love it. Always dedicated to the world of antiques. Look at this action from the side, it's quite delightful. A garden roller. Look at his little eyes light up. But always busy mates. If you had to choose, would it be the view or the car? It would be you, lovely. Let the festival of fun continue. The new trick is to lose money with the style and the panache that we're doing. Oh, so we're just setting a trend. Oh, yeah. Natasha started with £200. After her second sale, she has, well, quite a bit less. <laughs> £126.84. Philip also had a starter wodge of 200 smackers. He also has a bit less, but a bit more than Tash, with the sum of £156. Oh, there's a nice cow. That was a, that's a nice hairy cow. <laughs> Seeing as we're still in Scotland. <laughs> Blimey, laughing again, Phil. Are you feeling OK? Their Four Nation tour began in the Lake District, crossed the border to Scotland, will jump over to Northern Ireland and conclude with an auction in Wrexham. I know how loved you are in these parts. Oh, shut up. No, I'm serious. He's just fishing for compliments. Our raring to go road trippers are in South Lanarkshire shopping all the way to Paisley in Renfrewshire. First stop, the village of Rosebank. Natasha has been dropped off by her pal Phil and is now at Clyde Valley Antique Centre. Inside, a vast ocean of antiques awaits for Captain Tash. With a titch under £127, let's see which port she sails into first. Oh, they're quite sweet. Oh, they're quite cute. So, travelling inkwell, definitely a genre in which I've dabbled in the past, but not encased in leather. So, this one is marked for ink. Morocco leather, I think you'd describe this. They look to be turn of the century, could be late Victorian, could be Edwardians. How good is that? Spring action. Still got it. Still got it after all these years. You're speaking about the inkwell or yourself? I can't decide if I am more attracted to light. Along with this matching Vesta case for your matches, this little duo would have made an excellent travelling companion for the Edwardian gent and would have been fitted in a case. Black leather is really attractive. Yes, it's not in the world's best condition. There's a bit of a hole there. That is reflected in the price because the label has AF on it, so as you find them, and I have found them, I like them, but £30 is the price. I like them. And here we are travelling. I could write Phil a letter. And then, when I realise it's filled with too much passion, set it on fire. That's what I'm thinking. That's my plan. Steady yourself, girl. Now, where is our charming man? 
There's a spot in Glasgow City that... Philip is in Glasgow's east end of London Road. At the world-famous Barras. He's off to Randall's Antiques. And rascals by the score, everybody knows the Barras is the place. Did you know St Peter lost... Phil has just over £156 to spend. I'm just going to test my eyes, you know, just to see how it comes out. Ready? Oh. It's not very good, really, is it? No wonder I keep losing money. <laughs> you could do with a new pair of Gregory's. You see, there are certain things that are an absolute design statement. And in 1929 or thereabouts, Mies van der Rohe designed some chairs which have become known as the Barcelona chairs. New, those chairs would probably be six to eight hundred pounds each. You can have the three for eight hundred pounds there. But they are a real design statement. And they are out of my budget. Just a tad. What else can we find? Well, look at that. I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? If in doubt, revert to type. So those are salt-glazed feed troughs that have come off a farm somewhere or other. Well, there's a price ticket that says £35. I'm not sure whether that's each for the pair. But, I mean, you know, if I could buy one of those for a school, you know, I'm back feeling comfortable in my own territory. To sum up a Cyril ideal purchase, nothing says it quite like a big farm trough. While he continues to snuffle around, Natasha is in full hunting mode over in the Clyde Valley. I, never in my life have I knowingly been attracted to a paperweight, but this I can get on board with. This is gorgeous. OK, so I think we're in Italy. The style, which is sommerso, which is Italian for simply submerged, so kind of submerging these colours and casing them in the clear glass. The sommerso technique was originally developed in the 1930s and is a Murano glassmaking method. I think it's 60s or 70s. It's post-war anyway, but it's just such a pretty palette. Something quite candy about it. And I just think in this world of internet bidding, that would photograph so beautifully. There are paperweight collectors out there. I'm, I'm quite taken by it. It's priced at £28. It was Philip Serrell in the library with the paperweight. No, it's probably Colonel Mustard. Nah, defo Professor Plum. Stand by dealer Alan. Let's start with the paperweight. What would be your best price? 15. Oh, really? That, great. Give your hand, yeah. I, I'm so grateful for that. Fifteen pounds. Fifteen. Let's do it. The Edwardian Travelling Inc. and Vesta cases are owned by another dealer. Ticket price thirty pounds. I spoke to him and he said he can be very, very nice to you. Five pounds if he helps you beat Philip. Five pounds. Five pounds. Yeah. Are you serious? Seriously, that's what he said. Blimey, Alan. Well, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. That is so kind. Twenty pounds. Thank you. I'm really grateful. Thank you so much. I'm okay. so grateful. Right. Take care. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Bye -bye. And that other dealer. Most kind. £20 for the mid 20th century summer, so paperweight and the Edwardian Travelling Inc. investor cases. Wow, Tash now has a little over £106. We'll catch up with Natasha later. Back in Glasgow, Dealer Jane is on hand to help Phil. These, they're feed troughs, aren't they? Yes, they would um, have been uh, cattle feed troughs. The ticket price is £35. Can I give you 20 quid for one of them? You can, yes. Really? Yes, yes. Okay, you're an absolute angel. That little kind of bohemian bottle up there. It's lovely. Unfortunately, it's seen better days. Haven't we all? It's had a really, really interesting repair on it because the stopper has been broken off inside the bottle. But as a decorative. How old do you think that is? Well, I would think it's mid-1800s. Well, well, what's the best you can do that for? Ten pounds. Chance is almost too good to walk past, isn't it? He's going for it. Twist. <laughs> Come on. That's 30 for the two. You're yeah, a star. Yeah. Amazing buy. Thank you, Jane. 20 pounds for the late 19th century salt-glazed trough and 10 pounds for the 19th century glass decanter. <laughs> 
Philip now has £126. That weighty trough will be sent onwards to auction. Meanwhile, Natasha is on her very own stomping ground in the city of Glasgow. She's in the West End. To discover the roots of the very first uniformed Christian youth movement in the world. CEO and Battalion Secretary Jim McVean can tell us all about the Scottish Sunday School teacher that spawned a global movement, the Boys' Brigade. In the early 19th century, Glasgow was an exceptional city of contrasts. The spectacularly rich lived side by side with some of the deepest poverty in Britain. A young Sunday school teacher, William Alexander Smith, was constantly battling with unruly teenagers in his class. He sought for an answer. He had a military background in the Lanarkshire Rifle Volunteers, and he thought he would try something different, and he got the boys to come along to what was effectively a club night, uh, which became the Boys' Brigade. And it was based on sort of drill, discipline, physical activities, and an element of what we would call then Bible class, mm -hmm. which was effectively a midweek Sunday school activity. It, it would have been very structured and very disciplined. They quickly came up with an idea of a uniform. So he came up with a white haversack, a belt, and a pillbox hat that became the three main items of uniform. This uniform would give the boys a sense of belonging and items to take care of. There would have been inspections. The old uniforms would have had a brass buckle, which had to be polished. It would have a leather belt, which had to be polished. The organisation was formed during the British Empire and welcomed boys of all faiths. Companies formed from the Far East to the United States of America. In the 19th century, organised camping was brand new and a huge attraction to boys and young men. So too were the prizes and rewards. What did you have to do to obtain a trophy like one of these? Because these are magnificent early 20th century trophies. The Glasgow Battalion Knockout Cup football competition is one of the oldest football trophies in the world. Really? Is that what I'm looking at? We are still using it uh, as the, the Seniors Knockout Cup competition. <laughs> uh, now in its, well, it would be 131 years. That's amazing. In 1909, Sir William was knighted for all his energetic drive to better the lives of young men of all faiths. Nearly 140 years later, Sir William's Boys' Brigade still has relevance to many. Boys' Brigade is church-based, mm -hmm. has a link to the church, uh, but is an organisation for young people of all faiths and none. So we don't, you know, we don't discriminate uh, who can attend. Uh, I think that for the point of view of young people having an organisation that's got a structure, whether it's uniformed or not is good, I think, for young people's physical and mental health. Physical exercise has always been a key element of the boys' brigade. Let's go and join the fellas in action. Is it OK if I join your team? Of course. Right, here we go, here we go. After 140 years, the Boys' Brigade is still going strong with over 750,000 members oh. in 60 countries. Oh, it's coming in hot. And with the Girls' Association formed in 2008, Sir William Alexander Smith's vision has indeed stood the test of time. Oh, look, there's Philip. Do you know what? I've reverted to time. I brought a big lump of stone. I wonder how that's going to do. I don't know. Phil's hot on Tasha's tail and has also made his way to Glasgow's West End, ready to rock and roll. He's pointed the MG to Ruthven Mews. A gaggle of emporiums all under one roof. With £126 in his wallet, let's see what he plumps for. Shaking all over. Don't suppose you've got any cups and saucers, have you? No, they're hard to get. Liar. <laughs> Keep on rummaging. That's an eclectic pair of scissors, isn't it? So these are scissors or shears. When I saw them, I thought the end had been broken off. But they haven't, because that's the natural end of that scissor. These are 19th century. 
I actually think they're really cool things. Just look at the way your hand fits in there. It just works perfectly. Very ergonomic, Phil. So these would have been used in a tailor's, possibly for cutting long rolls of material. Interesting thing. Now, they don't have a price. But if I can buy those for 10 or 15 quid, you know, I've got to start putting myself gently on the road. I can't take risks. Don't blame you. It's the third leg and Phil's cash reserves are dwindling. Where's the Cyril nose taking him now? Oh, no. But actually, that might be an option. So that's a 19th century cast iron feed trough. I detect a bit of a theme here, Phil. I can put that with the trough that I've already bought and sell them as one lot. God, Benny, that's heavy. Just remember this. Legs apart, lift together. Um, and always keep your back straight. Noted. No price on the trough either. Stand by, Paul. Paul, have you ever thought about stock taking? Yeah, all the time. That's why I'm minimalistic. Let's kick off with the cast iron trough then. Would that be 18, 19, 19, 10? Probably, it's an old one. But I've also right. seen these. Oh, they're nice. And there's no price on the sheep. I don't have price in there, no. You, you don't price on anything. The shears and the feed trough. I'd like to offer you 40 quid for the two. I can't do that, Phil. Tell you what I'm going to do. Because I started out with an odd sum of money, right? Right. There's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Or oh, you could keep going. No, no, that's the end of that look. But what I have got here is a very odd thing. Sure, mate. It's an odd pound. Oh, I've got a deal. Really? Yeah. Top man. Thank you very much Thanks, indeed. Paul. Thank you, Paul. That breaks down to 35 for the cast down trough and £16 for the pair of 19th century tailor's shears, leaving Phil with just £75. That weighty trough will be sent on to auction. I do love a Highland cow. Oh, I do, I do. Oh. There's a lovely term. It's not a herd of cattle for Highland mean? cattle. What is it? What is it? I can't remember. It's a fold, Tash. Huh. Nighty night. Wakey, wakey, rise and shine. I had a huge cup of tea this morning. Did you? Yeah. That could lead to a countdown moment, couldn't it? <laughs> What's that? I'll have a pee, please, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Phil, you started early today. Yesterday, Natasha was a bargainista, picking up a mid-20th century summer so paperweight and a matching pair of Edwardian travelling ink investor cases. How good is that? Spring action. Leaving her with just over £100. While Phil was also careful with his cash, he has a weighty combo lot of 19th century troughs, a 19th century bohemian glass decanter, and a pair of 19th century brass tailor's shears. If in doubt, revert to time. Philip has 75 smackers left. So I bought this bottle decanter. The stopper had broken, and the bottom of the stopper was wedged in it. Oh, oh that sounds good. And then I dropped it. Oh, you break your buy. No, I've dropped it. The buy was perfectly all right, but it knocked the stopper out. <laughs> so how lucky is that? Yeah, incredibly. OK, if you rubbed the bottle and a genie came out, what would be your three wishes? Well, I'll attach to do another road trip with you, huh? You soppy old goat. Their Scottish sojourn today will be around the city of Glasgow and Renfrewshire. With Philip dropped off elsewhere, Natasha begins in the Finiston area of Glasgow. A hotspot for cool city hipsters. So, only fitting Tash pays a visit. <laughs> Stand by Finiston antiques. And what can Tash find in here with her remaining £106 and pennies? Oh, that's nice. I think the person who owned this probably used it very regularly. When you hold it up to the light, you can see the two 
voids that are within. So 1%, which would be this side, because this nicely has its little stopper. The other would have contained smelling salts, practical and pretty. This, shall we say, bristle blue glass chamber, it's that deep blue associated with the southwest. Yes, two 18th century Bristolians, a potter and a chemist, mixed cobalt oxide with molten glass to create this incredible colour we know today as Bristol Blue. It's about 150 years old. We're in the late 19th century. Queen Victoria's on the throne. Ladies are maintaining a certain sense of style when they carry with them scent bottles. It's priced at £45. What else can we find? Nice swing. I'm obsessed with gimbals. And you'd think that they are, yeah, yeah. I can, I love these things. I see them in my loft. Bum, 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 let's see you. Okay, marked on the base ETA, E-T-A-I-N. ETA is French for pewter. So they fall into antique territory, probably about 100, 110 years old. I think we're in the 20th century. I don't think we're in the late 19th, but if we are, all the better. A maritime must. The gimbal design ensures the candle stays upright through the motion of the sea. And actually, I've just noticed, as I've spun them around there, there is a little look. There's a little cutout so that you can hang them on the wall. So they are sconces and they are chamber sticks. I am very keen on these. 65 pounds. I'm not scared, but I'm definitely here to hang on. Stand by, Mo. Starting with the late Victorian Bristol blue scent bottle. I know that you have 45 pounds on it. And I don't want to be too cheeky, Mo, for goodness okay, sake. I don't want to be too yeah, cheeky. Okay. But I'm thinking, what would, like, the very best price be? To I'm... you, 25 pounds. 25? 25. OK, let's go with that. I'm grateful for that. Thanks, Mo. And the pair of French gimbaled chamber sticks? 65 on them? Yeah. 45? Is that right? 45. Oh. No. 40 pounds. We could do 40? 40. And that's it? Yeah, I think it's... 40 pounds. 40 pounds, I think it's... 40, 25, 65. Call it 60 for you. Oh, are you sure? Oh, yeah. 100%? 100%. 100 oh, that's really kind of you. OK, that's 40, 50, 60. I'll just pop it down. Oh, right. Mo, you're a legend. Thanks ever so much. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Mo. £25 for the late Victorian Bristol Blue scent bottle and 35 for the pair of French gimbal chamber sticks. Tash now has £46 and 84p. Meanwhile, Phil is also on the outskirts of the no mean city. He's made it to Finiston Quay. To visit a towering symbol of Glasgow's epic engineering and maritime heritage, Built in 1931, the iconic Finiston Crane dominates the city skyline along a River Clyde. Alan Wilson, from the Big Crane Company, is passionate about preserving one of the last surviving cantilever cranes in the world. So would that have been one on its own, or were there lots of those around here? There was about 15 of them on the Clyde, but there's, there's only about four, four left. Uh... Well, so why is that one left? Well, it's been preserved as part of the city's heritage, yeah. sort of industrial and maritime heritage. It represents Glasgow as a symbol. By the 19th century, Glasgow was the second city of the British Empire. Shipbuilding was at the very heart of the industry here, with one-fifth of the world's ships being built on the River Clyde. Fully operational by 1932, Crane No. 7 cost nearly £70,000, the equivalent of £4.5 million today. With a lifting capacity of 175 tonnes, the Finiston crane was vital for lifting heavy machinery and goods. Was that kind of used in the building of ships or the unloading of ships? Loading and unloading yeah. of ships were many built across the world. 
Its primary function was the link with the Caledonian engine works up in Springburn, and about 30,000 steam engines uh, were constructed there, and of course they were driven down here, uh, horses or diesel trucks, and they were then loaded by that crane onto the ships. And if you go across the world, you'll still see trains and rails that were uh, constructed in this area yeah. uh, being used to this very day. It's estimated that 25% of all the world's locomotives were built in Glasgow. So back in the day, uh -huh. this must have been an absolute hive of activity. Very much so, because remember, it wasn't just the, the maritime traffic. You had the whole shipbuilding industry uh, up the, the Clyde, where thousands of people would have plied their trade. The peak of shipbuilding at the start of the 20th century would see 200 shipyards along the Clyde constructing ocean liners to warships. In its pump, how many people would have worked here, do you think? Oh, 70,000 uh, people at its peak. I mean, that's the population of a lot of towns in those days, isn't it? Very much so. It was the very centre of the Industrial Revolution and the local people worked in the, the yards and in the docks and uh, everything was linked to the clay. It's a special thing. Very much so. A special river, special yeah. city. Post-war, Competing international shipyards would see a gradual and deep decline along the River Clyde. By the 1970s, this once engine room of the British Empire was no more. Would you like to come up here with me and have a look? Mate, I, I, I'd absolutely love to, but I haven't got Harvey's jacket on. That's fortunate we've brought one with us and a helmet as well. You're talking to a man who's terrified of heights. I don't blame you, Phil. Standing at 170 feet high, this is a mammoth construction. And I feel such a wind that this is actually high enough for me because I really, really do not like heights at all. Oh, my life. You did well to even attempt it, Phil. Right, Alan, onwards to the top, then. Alan, how are you? <laughs> I'm fine, Phil. It's a pity you couldn't join me up here. It's almost like a massive dinosaur, isn't it? But it's quite frail at the same time. Yeah, it needs some TLC, and it's, of course it's our objective to uh, regenerate it, to uh, paint it and make it once more a visitor attraction so that future generations can learn of the history of this part of Glasgow, what the function of the crane was, and of course learn more about the general industrial and maritime heritage of the city. Well, well do give me a phone call when you've got that lift working, won't you? I will do a totemic representation of the city and its industrial maritime heritage, every success to Alan and his colleagues to help preserve and protect this giant superstructure for many years to come. Now, where's our Glasgow gal? Cyril's on a Cyril. He's bought a farmyard feeder thing. He's going to insist to the crowd that they turn it into a coffee table. I don't know. You know him so well. Natasha is pointing towards the town of Paisley in Renfrewshire. At one point, the town was responsible for making 90% of the world's sewing thread. Her last stitch attempt <laughs> at shopping is in here. Interesting run, Tash. With just a few bobbins to spend, just a titch over £45, what will she be drawn to? 48 hours ago, I might not have been so au fait with sure and steadfast. But do I not know all about the boys' brigade now? I do. Do I want, what do you call these again? The horse, a horsey kind of situation. Is this not a bit of a Philip Serrell ex-PE teacher situation? I think I should just leave it alone. It's definitely not going to take it to auction. This is as athletic as I get. You ready for it? Sorry down there. Ten points. Slightly over-generous scoring, I'd say. Downstairs, a Cyril is on the loose. He has 75 smackers in his kitty. How Andy Murray ever got good at tennis with rackets like this is just beyond me. It's a miracle, Phil. Cool, blimey, his jokes, eh? We have not broken, chipped Clara's Cliff. I think I can live with chipped because if my eyes did not deceive me, yeah, 10 pounds. 
Look at the weight of the paint. Look how it's been applied. It's so evenly done. The paint there, the weight of it, differs to the paint here. And what Clarice Cliff loved, and what she instructed her paintresses to do, was to show the brush strokes. She wanted people to know that these were hand-painted items, not transfer printed, hand-painted. So we can see the hand of the paintress, and you get three pieces. Yes, one of them's chipped. Arguably the most important piece. Yes, it's chipped. But 10 pounds? I mean, Phil's not interested, but I am. Very nice they are too. Now, where's the wind-up merchant? See, that's a nice, quite a nice little mirror, isn't it, really? It's got the carved frame of this running border all the way round, which looks like trailing vine, because you've got the vine leaves and you've got um, fruit there, grapes. And what I like about it is that the border is continuous. It's kind of got a bit of an arts and crafts look to it. I suspect the mirror is probably a replacement. It's a good little thing, that. I like that. Me too. And it doesn't have a ticket price. Looks like Tash is ready for a deal. Stand by, Ben. I hope Phil's not causing you too much trouble. A wee bit, but... Just a wee bit. To be expected, I think. Do you know what? You took the words out of my mouth. It is to be mm -hmm. expected with mm -hmm. him. And um, I'm not going to cause you any trouble at all. Because I'm going to pay the full ticket price. OK. And it's a big one. Is it big? It's £10. Pounds. Oh. It's the three bits of Clarice Cliff beer it. Ah, very nice. A wee nice. bit chipped. A wee bit, but still nice. Let me find my money and just give you £10. Pounds. Ben, it's a done deal. Done. And do you know what? We've all got homes to go to. I'll tell Phil to hurry up. Yes, please. Thank you. See you in a bit. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks. Phil, are you done? Tash is done and dusted. That bargain buy leaves her with just over £35. Pounds. Great. Anyway, this is an Edwardian mahogany um, gallery tray, and this is called marquetry. And marquetry is a design, a picture, for want of a better word, in the wood. If it's just a geometric design, it's called parquetry. This little number doesn't have a price either. Stand by, Ben. You've got another customer. I wanna, I'd like to buy two things from you, the mirror and the tray. The Would that be 40? OK. All right. You can just about stretch to that. You're a gentleman, thank no you. Problem. So, here's the money. £10 for the Arts and Crafts mirror and £30 for the Edwardian marquetry tray. Phil has £35 and change left. Nearly the same as Tash. Oh, Phil, it's miserable! You brought the weather with you, Tash. <laughs> with all purchases carefully stowed away in the boot, the shopping is now over. There's another crow. <laughs> They're bigger out here. Funnily enough, you do see lots of crows in the countryside. <laughs> City girl. Best get some shut eye, eh? With a frenzy of excitement, we're limbering up for a watch of the third auction. Oh, I've been here. Have oh, you... this is an amazing place, yeah. The Scottish Maritime Museum is an A-listed former engine shop that was salvaged and relocated from Glasgow's Clyde in 1991. It houses a spectacular collection of vessels, nationally significant to Scotland. Our road trip buddies have enjoyed a Scottish whirl and now find themselves in the town of Irvine in North Ayrshire, while their antiques have been dispatched to West Yorkshire, to Halifax Mill Auctioneers for sale in the room, on the phone and the web. The man in command is James Watson. Room bid has got this at 160. Natasha bought five items for the sum of £90. Any faves? So this is a strong piece. Uh, lots of Murano as well, lots of Spanish and or Italian glass, Medina glass. Good example. I think we'll see a good result. Phil collected five lots for £121. Thoughts, please, James? So there's a lot of demand at the moment for haberdashery pieces, anything associated with sewing, uh, but at the end of the day, we are dealing with just a pair of scissors, so we'll have to see. Back to Irvin. What I love, we've even got a crowd look. I know. <laughs> I find them Thank you for people. coming. I know, the captain's watching. No pressure, the blooming captain's watching. Never mind about the captain. It's positively arctic in here. Hot tea at the ready, while we watch via the tablet. First up, 
This fills Edwardian marquetry tray. It almost looked like it was made yeah, yesterday. It, yeah, it's it amazing. Did. What a survivor. It, it, so tenner at the back of the room. Oh my Side, life. Side ten pounds in the room bidder looking for twelve. Twelve on the internet. Fourteen, sir. Fourteen. He's making sweet Nine. music. Sixteen. Sixteen in the room. Thank you. Eighteen. The auctioneer is the conductor. Yeah, twenty, madam. So twenty, twenty-two, twenty-four, twenty-four in the middle of the room. Twenty-six to my right. Twenty-eight, madam. So twenty-six pounds with the room bidder. Twenty-eight now. Oh, a wee creeper. Twenty-eight, thirty, sir. So thirty pounds to my right. Yes, yes. Thirty pounds. Thirty pounds then. Oh, I'll come back in there. That one's selling to the room bidder for thirty. <laughs> Not sure I recognise a giggly Phil. Turns out you know exactly what an inlaid tray is worth, Philip. So exactly. Quid, yeah. On to Natasha's matching pair of Edwardian travelling ink investor cases. What you want here is the auction room to have a minimum bid policy of ten pounds. That would be great. And then you're just home and hose, aren't you? Twenty to start for these. Two. Oh, go on. Twenty to start for the pair straight in on the internet maiden bid. There, Get twenty in. pounds. Why? Twenty pounds. Looking for twenty-two. Final warning then. Twenty-two at the back of the room. Oh, well done. Last, last minute, and that's selling at the back of the room for twenty-two. Oh, hello, hello. Nice. The little bargain has paid off. Well, that's good, isn't it? That's something to write home about, finally. I see what you did there. <laughs> Phil's big weighty trough combo next. Animal trough? No, thank you. Yeah. Coffee table? Yes, yes please. please. £20 bid. 22 24 26 now 28 with oh, us. Oh, we climb, we climb. Looking for 30 for these. £30 in the room. 32 yes, in the middle. 34, sir. Yeah, 34 to my right. 36, 38. So 38. Oh, I love that you've started a room middle. bidding war. So 40, oh. 44, room bidder. 46 now, the woken up. 48 with the room bidder looking for 50. There, we're close. So 48 with that room bidder looking for 50. Go on, mate, 50. come on. Selling then to the room. 50. One, One more. more. 55 is it? Make it 60. For 55. So well, that's bang on what it cost me again. <laughs> <laughs> Uncanny. Just like your laughter. People just do not have. Serral vision. They just don't see it. Maybe they will with your mid 20th century summer so paperweight tash. I think I might have had serral vision on this. Coffee table? Well, no, but I think it might make exactly what I paid for it. It's 20 to start. Yes! That would be a good number. So 20 straight in on the internet. Made Profit. 20 pounds. 22 we've got in the room. So 22, 24, 26 model. Oh, it's gone wild. 30, 32. So 30 pounds with a commission, sure. So thirty pounds with a commission. I like that. So final warning then. I'm so chuffed. To the room commission for thirty. I did love it. As did the bidders. Good result. Uh, it looked a cool thing. Actually. Oh, it was so cool. Yeah. It was so cool. Ooh, yeah. Phil. The excitement mounts. Now can Phil's arts and crafts mirror reflect a biggie profit? You can't lose money on this. You said it. Straight in, ten pounds. Straight oh, in. Pounds I like. Looking for twelve. Come Five on. Eighteen now. Now looking for twenty. Well, excuse me. Room's quiet for this, and that is selling. Final warning to the internet for just eighteen. And you'll take it. You will take that profit. Too right, I will. <laughs> Not exactly a biggie, but a titchy return is better than nothing. Eight pounds. <laughs> I feel quite proud of myself now. Tash now with a Victorian Bristol blue scent bottle. Commission interest. Oh. And I can start us off at 26. So 26 oh, a pound. pounds to start. <laughs> 26, 28, 30 with us on the commission. 32, 34 with us on the commission. 36, 38. Oh, Phil, with us. 40, relatively, 40, this is wild. 42 with us. The 46, 48 with us on the commission. Well done. 48, 55 is taking it anyway. I feel like I've won the lottery. The now. 30 good. Pounds now. 65 now with 65 then. Final warning selling to the internet for 65. Ah, oh, the whiff of success, Tash. Biggest profit so far. You know when people talk about winning the lottery? You've just done it. I think this must be what I it mean, feels like. Th Someone hand me a novelty check, because that feels amazing. On to the 19th century brass tailor's scissors from Phil. It's difficult to tell from the image, but they look massive. Yeah. They're that big, but they fit the hand. So 22 straight in. Oh, get yeah. in. 24 now. Phil, this now. is it, this is it. 26, this is a shock. Uh, yeah, so you and me both made, yeah. 30 pounds. 32 now. I don't think the auctioneer's meant to say that. Excuse me. 34 at the back of the room. 34. And that's selling to the room bidder for 34 pounds. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. 
All right, Phil, you definitely cut a dash there, sir, all. Ah. What was the way you described it? The way it felt in the hand? Yeah, it fits the hand. That's what did it. it fits, fits the, the hand. hand. Fits the thumb. Onwards with Natasha's Claris, Cliff Cup and matching saucers. In the 1930s, this probably blew people's minds. Absolutely, yeah. A rectangular saucer. <laughs> what are you thinking? Yeah. So, £20 got to be worth that, surely. Nobody at 20, just a tenner then, just £10. Oh, there we go. no. 20, worth that anyway. £20. Okay. So £20. Pounds oh, there is 20. Now. Looking for 22. 20 is where we are, though. Any more for any more. Oh, go on. And that's selling to the internet for 20. £20. Pounds. Lovely little set. Lovely little profit. But you're 100% up, aren't you? Well, in percentage terms, it's a great yeah, profit. Yeah, in real terms. Yeah. In real terms. It's no, a tiny listen, profit. trust me, profit in any terms for us is great. The 19th century green glass decanter from Phil is now next. It doesn't scream Philip Serrell. No, it doesn't. But it does, to me, scream potential for profit. Big bid coming in straight away. So for this Bohemian piece, 70 pounds. Are you joking? 80 pounds now. Platform. So I knew it all the time. I, I thought this might make a hundred, really. And that one's selling then for 80 pounds. Oh, are you so chuffed? I don't know about chuffed. I'm relieved. Crikey! Amazing result. He's obviously in shock. I just love it. I love the story of that decanter. It was in the barras. It was broken. You dropped it. You fixed it. It made you, what, a £70 profit? Yeah, know, it's too it. good. I'm it's going back good. to the Barras. Yeah. I'm you... now a Barras boy. It's the last lot of today. Natasha's pair of gimbaled French chamber sticks. So 20, 22 now. £22 now, looking for 24. Keep going. Now we've got, looking for 26. It's got 26 now, 26 with the internet, looking for 28, 28 now, 30 now, 30, it's creeping up, 30 pounds, 32 now, 32, looking for 34, 34. Good bidding, 34, 36. Good bidding. 36, heading in the right direction. 36 is where we are, and that's selling, 38 now. Uh, Go on. 38, 40 now, it's carrying on, 40. Where we are, selling then for 40. Well, a flicker of a profit there, Tash. We might have just grafted our way back into a little bit of respectability. <laughs> Do you think? Just a tiny bit. Let's tot up the figures, shall we? Natasha began with £126.84 and after sale room costs has made a lovely profit of £55.14. and pennies. She now has £181.98p. While Phil kicked off with £156. After all auction costs, he's made an astonishingly similar profit of £56.94, and pence, giving him £212.94p, giving Phil a hat-trick of auction wins. Oh, oh, she's sounding good. She is. She sounds like you. Really? Fired up and ready, ready to, to go. go. <laughs> yup, Cyril's a wild one. Next on the trip, we're all about the pong. If you ever had festering old cricket salt, they smell like stinking bishop. Natasha gets arty. Oh, no, that's not... I'm joking, I'm joking. My heart! And Phil makes a busy mate. How are you? 